ever onward, the season three roller coaster continues. So take a journey with me as I watch through Star Wars Rebels for the first time. Well, hello there. My name is Jeremy and welcome back to Freeform Disney. Only one big announcement this time, and that is that the next Rebels livestream, which is going to be for the three episodes after these ones here, that is coming Sunday the 14th of March at noon Pacific Standard Time or 8 p.m. UTC London Time. And I'm looking forward to seeing y'all then. Well, now then, on to the four Rebels episodes for today. We're starting up with episode 7 of season 3, and that is Imperial Super Commandos. With a name like that. <laughs> okay, so we pop in and Sabine's over playing a hollow cube game with Fen Rao and his self. Off where we've got him being held. It looks like we're still trying to convince him to join the rebellion. It's interesting how much time Sabine spends with him. I don't think she knew him before everything. But even so, it's still another Mandalorian, right? And they see eye to eye on some things. Uh, heck, their loyalty to Mandalore itself, for instance. Even if they carry that out a little bit differently. So this episode is definitely going to have Van Rao in it, otherwise why did we start it here? And that is because, guess what, we've lost contact with Concord Dawn. And so the plan is going to be to send Sabine, Ezra, and Fen Rao in the Phantom 2 to get hit by Concord Dawn and check out the situation. Not going to land there or anything. I think we could probably check it without Fen Rao the first time, but that, that's fine. After all, we don't have a story otherwise and would have to just watch the second mission otherwise, right? <laughs> Uh, well, anyway, we get a big Les High moment where Rao's in the ship with them and Ezra just stops guarding him and turns his back on him. And Rao, who has his hands in front of him, comes up behind and bashes Ezra over the head and then, well, takes out Sabine too. Dying Ezra. Ay, 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 man. Oh, by the way, nice paint job on the Phantom 2. Not as flashy as I expected out of Sabine. I thought there would be something far more intriguing, but hey, it's still nice. And they get down to the planet because Rao went ahead and landed it there while they were all out and find Rao stunned. And that is because he is looking at the site of his base burning. And apparently they were all taken out by other Mandalorians. Woo, harks back to a comment earlier in the episode about the infighting among the Mandalorians. Yeah. <laughs> A little more info about the protectors in here. The protectors are loyal to the throne and recruit the best people from all the clans. All the more reason they're surprised that, hey, they were taken off guard that way. But who could have done it? Oh, look, there's an Imperial probe droid. Hmm, wonder if that has something to do with it. So yeah, we've got Mandalorians who are serving the Empire. Traitors, as both Sabine and Rao are on the same page on that one. And the leader who captures Ezra in this case, because they come down, they capture Ezra, they capture Chopper, the other two get out. But who is it? Somebody we know, Gar Saxon, who's currently the Imperial Viceroy of Mandalore. Now, funny enough, if I hadn't watched Clone Wars first, I guess I probably wouldn't know Gar Saxon. I found him quite interesting to actually popping up into that Clone Wars arc. I'm like, oh, hey, that's interesting. <laughs> Uh, explains why he was built up a little bit over in that Siege of Mandalore. So now it makes more sense. Yet yeah, definitely care about him here. Well, all of this leads to Fen Rao and Sabine having to grudgingly work together until eventually Rao comes a little more on the page and realizes that, yeah, yeah, probably would've just been killed if I was here. And so yeah, it works well. Oh, and well, eventually they almost get captured because Fen Rao takes the ship and uh, abandons them after they've taken and gotten Ezra out. Uh, yeah, well, what do you expect, right? And Saxon intriguingly invokes Sabine's mother during the course of this, who apparently has also joined the Empire and has been looking for Sabine. And, ooh, there's some family drama in here that's gonna come back later. Whether season three or four, it's definitely coming back. And hey, they've got this perfect opportunity to take out Saxon and his whole crew of Imperial Mandalorians because Chopper sent feedback into all their helmets and disabled them for a little bit. And, oh, but we don't do it. 
We figure, hey, why take them out? I mean, that would end the action. We wouldn't get a nice cool chase scene. I mean, we could do that. But no, 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 no. Let's just go ahead and rock it out of there. Because Sabine actually went ahead and grabbed a cool rocket pack off one of the other Mandalorians. And off they go. And we get a chase scene. And hey, at least one of those Mandalorians there from the Imperial side definitely died. Big fiery explosion. Whoa. <laughs> well, we burn their ship too. We get to see a fight between Sabine and Saxon, which is fun. Definitely fun, by the way. And both of them end up losing their jetpacks in the course of it. Saxon, before we get back up, Sabine as she's almost to the ship on her escape. And well, so much for that short-lived jetpack. Would have been nice to actually have Sabine with a jetpack in a longer term sense, but not yet. <laughs> Sometime later on, maybe we'll get Sabine a real jetpack that'll actually last for a little while. How about a jetpack with some better armor on it that doesn't get taken out so easily, maybe? <laughs> oh, maybe when she goes back and eventually meets her mother, maybe there will be a jetpack there waiting for her. And hey, our people escape. Saxon's still alive. No surprise. Oh, and by the way, the reason they escaped is because Fen Rao came back and saved them. I just thought I'd note that. Fen Rao, yeah, he's joining the rebellion now. Yeah, after all that. <laughs> so this is definitely not the end of seeing Fen Rao and Saxon and, well, Sabine by extent, of course, too. Definitely gonna be some interesting Mandalore action going on fun episode. I definitely enjoyed this one right here. I admit it was a little clunky and forced at times, but I like a lot of what it was trying to do. And hey, there was some good Sabine and Mandalorian stuff in here. Definitely makes me interested to see where we go next. But first, we're on to episode eight, Iron Squadron. Oh, okay, so we got a new squad. Okay, this, this could be interesting, right? Well, let's get there. So first, we've got the Phantom 2 docked with a ghost, which by the way, feels really weird. I guess it fits, but man, it just does not look right to me. I'm too used to seeing the Phantom with the ghost, right? <laughs> so what are we up to? Well, the Empire is planning a big attack against my capo. And so we're gonna go over there and evacuate rebel sympathizers from the planet. But we've got this Iron Squadron, which apparently is a new ship. And we've got this kid, Mart, who's captaining it. And Mart apparently is the nephew of our Commander Sato. And Mart's father is dead. He used to have a legit Iron Squadron, apparently, at one point operating out of that planet. And now I guess it's just this one ship with three kids and a droid. And that's really about it. But hey, they're good with their techniques. They can take out some light cruisers and stuff on occasion. And just go ahead using cargo, explosives, and tricks to go ahead and get through. So, definitely Sato wants him to go save his kid. Well, his nephew, I should say. Unsurprisingly, so that's gonna be part of what we're up to. And so we get a bit of a mirror image, I guess, kind of, of a bit of our crew, because Hera, Sabine, and Ezra, plus Chopper, go onto that ship and to go talk to them all. So, yeah, you know, three and three, along with the droids. By the way, interesting, I'm not used to that one alien species right there, Guti, the pink one. I don't think so, anyway. Uh, someone tell me if I should be or shouldn't be. Also, I don't want to look this up too much. I don't know, maybe these people are coming back in a future episode. I could definitely see that as a possibility. Well, anyway, they're definitely not willing to leave their planet. They're that kind of stubborn people to go stick there, especially Mart. And so that's part of what's going on. We jump on off to Thrawn. Well, Thrawn's in the area and hey, he sends Constantine to go take care of this whole problem with a single light cruiser. Unless you're not up to it. I will take care of it immediately. <laughs> uh, well, hey, we're gonna kill off Constantine, right? Yeah, not yet, apparently. Not yet. Yeah, so we get some nice lines in there, like how we fight is just as important as what we fight for. And, well, they try to go ahead and get everybody off, but Mart goes and tricks them all and stays behind in the ship. Ha ha, he's gonna go ahead and take on Constantine in his ship. Ha ha ha. Oh, sorry, they haven't taken out a light cruiser yet. This is the first time they fight a light cruiser, which is bigger than anything they've seen before. And, of course, Mark fails miserably, and Constantine disables his ship and then decides to set it up as a trap for the rest of the Rebels by shoving a Magno mine on it. And, well, the Rebels, via Hera, decide, yeah, we're gonna go ahead and spring that trap, sure. We've got a fleet, but we're only gonna take the Ghost, because that's how much we think of you guys. We can beat you just with the Ghost. We don't need more. <laughs> Uh, well, Chopper and the new R3 droid disable the Magno mine, attach it to a cargo crate, because we're going to trick the Imperials. 
but things aren't going quite great until Sato just comes in. He was too far away originally, so he comes in at the 11th hour with his big old Corellian Corvette. Ha ha! And Constantine, unsurprisingly, loses this fight. We do get to see an Imperial Star Destroyer pop up at the end. I think it's an Imperial, an ISD. It could be a VSD. Uh, didn't pay enough attention there. Anyway, point being, he comes in and yeah, we get a nice little final menacing piece between Thrawn and Constantine. Dwa, dwa, dwa. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> and Thrawn also, before that, said something to Sato about wondering what it would take to bring him back. And we will see each other again. Ooh, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, yeah, that was pretty much the episode. I, I've got to say, it's a bit of an eh. It's kind of one of those roller coaster continuing for me. We had a good one. This one didn't care for the episode. I didn't care for the Iron Squadron crew, to be honest, really at all. It never got into them. And the plot mm, was just kind of eh. And to be honest, I wish Thrawn hadn't even been in this episode. So, yeah, it's kind of a bit of the worrying about the overuse of Thrawn, and I don't feel this was a good use of him. Oh, well, say la vie. Moving right along, let us move to the next episode. This is episode 9, the Wikothu Job. Wikothu Job. Something like that. So who's popping up this time? It's Hondo! Hondo is back. Man, we love Hondo and Rebels. Kind of one of those, Hondo would just probably become a fan favorite in Clone Wars. This we see Hondo a lot here in Rebels. <laughs> and also has Morgan. I, I could have done without that. And frankly, he doesn't add a dang thing to this episode, as far as my opinion is concerned. So hey, big profit time, because Ezra has set up a deal with Hondo. And so hey, we're going to go work with Hondo and his Morgan to hopefully get some proton bombs. So off to the planet, when in Kothu. There's an abandoned Imperial freighter. Well, actually, it's not really abandoned in that same kind of way. It's really something Hondo and as Morgan attacked and... Well, yeah, but it's stuck in a storm on the planet that's going to destroy it. So Hondo kind of needed a bit of help to take care of this. Oh, and hey, we actually do get to see AP back, uh, Chopper's friend. Cool to get to see him a little bit in here. Again, I like it. We didn't really get to see enough AP Chopper interaction, but still. Oh, anyway, so we go through this whole thing and Hondo's Ugnaughts are on there is how we found out that, oh, right, not really abandoned per se. And... I, yeah, we, we go through this episode. Frankly, the Hondo as Morgan stuff was annoying. I think as Morgan felt like it was in there kind of as like a dumb, annoying comic relief. At least so goes my opinion. I mean, as Morgan's the one that screws stuff up, he wanders off, gets caught by a sentry droid, which then endangers everything. And hey, then AP tells everybody not to go ahead and engage the sentry droids. And of course, as Morgan shoots one. So yeah, which activates all of them and they then have to get out of there fast, which they already had to do because of the storm too. But we then have the droids coming in on top of it all. And so, yeah, we, we get off there. We actually did get a good number of proton bombs. And as for Hondo and his Morgan, they end up with, well, pretty much nothing. I, I could have done without this. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I enjoy Hondo. It's nice to see him on occasion. But, oh, man, this was not my episode. I, I mean, if there's an episode I skip, this is on the list of potential skippable episodes for Rebels if I was watching through again. Maybe there's something that'll come relevant in another episode. But to be honest, I don't even feel that there's something here that really does, other than the fact we got proton bombs, I guess. But we could have just said that we got them somewhere. Uh, just not enough to redeem it for me. I mean, maybe you loved it, and that, that's perfectly fine. Just didn't work for me. Okay, episode 10 in Inside Man. Let's roller coaster our way back on up to a high again, rather than on these lows we've been. Okay, so Ezra and Kanan are back on Lothal. And hey, that's interesting off the bat. And we can see Ryder Asadi back in here. Oh, that's always fun. So apparently we've got people sabotaging the factories. Uh, hey, we saw a speeder bike blow up when it went too fast because, yeah, we're, we're taking those speeder bikes out and doing all kinds of stuff to other things that are being produced on Lothal because it's actually all got uh, some big factories going on. And whose plan was this on the sabotage? It's actually our old friend, Mr. Sumar. The, the farmer guy from way back in season one. It's a great way of bringing him back in. Somebody we kind of know, but he wasn't a lot to him. So he kind of got radicalized after uh, <laughs> the Imperials did what they did to him, huh? <laughs> Dying. 
<laughs> nice. Well, anyway, apparently the plan is in the future they're aiming to take out the facility. So Phoenix Squadron as well as another cell is going to go ahead and do that. So that doesn't happen in this one. That's clearly something somewhere in the future. So I don't know when that's happening, but looking forward to that. That's going to be probably be a big episode or maybe a pair of episodes. Maybe it's the season finale. That could be where we're headed. I don't know. Sure. We'll, we'll see what we see. We do find out the Empire's working on a secret weapon. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, some other interesting things while we're here on the Lothal. All the hollow screens with the Imperial flag. Oh, very fascist Empire feel to all of this. Okay, so anyway, let's go in because we're trying to find out some information on what's going on and what this secret weapon is they're working on in there. So Ezra and Kanan infiltrate along with Chopper and also Sumar since he's working there, goes with them. Well, and guess what? Eh, it's not just the normal people there because Governor Price and Callus are there. Oh, and Imperial High Command, i.e. Thrawn. <laughs> oh, and what happens next is just one of those wow damn moments because what does Thrawn do well he has our good old friend Sumar test the last speeder bike that he made and ins or inspected and bring it up to full speed well we know what happens when it goes up to full speed we saw it recently and Thrawn forces him to finish even when it's clear it's overheating so the speeder bike explodes and Sumar dies in front of everyone assembled. It's like, wow, see, there's how you can go ahead and make use of a character that we do know a little and have some connection to. Ezra certainly has a connection. Oh, yeah, yo, yeah, yo, yeah, yeah. nicely done. <laughs> Thrawn, now that I have your attention, know this. Whatever you build here, you will test personally. I expect your malfunction rates will drop substantially. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably so. Dang. Extra piece, we can see how shocked Callus is in the background, which is an interesting bonus point. Ezra, by the way, quick to anger on this. Unsurprising given where he is. He gets held back by Kanan, so it's not like it's a problem here. And now we get into the rest of this because the whole facility gets locked down. Columns are jammed, so we can't even communicate outside. But Chopper makes a distraction after Thrawn and her big officers are gone and Kanan and Ezra dash on off. So we're gonna find out what the secrecy of the project in A2 is. What are they guarding? Some kind of new fighter initiative. Dun dun dun. Oh, and during this episode, we're having a bit of fun sending Kanan and Ezra through what I'm calling the Forest of Coincidence. Which, by the way, is a Galavant reference. If you don't know Galavant, watch that show sometimes. Really good show. Anyway, but point being is anytime they need something, it just suddenly materializes for them. They need new disguises. Oh, look, two troopers start walking up. They need a clearance code to get into A2. Oh, look, a droid with a clearance code shows up. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine, and it's fun here, actually, because we're purposely making it a joke. And in fairness, they also probably would have gotten what they needed eventually anyway. I I'm not worried, even if we didn't do a whole forced of coincidence thing. So yeah, good old wink and nod to the audience. A little fourth wall break in that sense, but yeah, it was good. Anyway, we get to see Theron off on the other side with displays of pictures and arts of from our crew, graffiti from Sabine with the Phoenix symbol. And he's of course talking with Callus and explaining how important it is to be able to study all this. And it's not nice to get to see this because Thrawn very much cares about artwork. That's certainly the Thrawn I know already. Caring about the artwork and being able to understand, well, your enemies through it as well. Their culture is heavily important. Well, anyway, we've got the data from A2 and onward we're rolling and we find out that, guess what? It's Agent Callus who is Fulcrum who got them the information to come here. And by the way, Chopper gets along with Callus easily. Hey, no problem, which is kind of fun, actually. As for Ezra and Kanan, not so much. <laughs> uh, they have uh, a little too much fun beating him up to make things look convincing, shall we say? Yeah. Thrawn, of course, figures out what's going on and knows, uh, tries, but again, this is two Jedi, so good luck stopping two Jedi from getting out and making it past the Imperials. To be honest, even if Callus didn't help them escape, they probably would have pulled it off anyway. Now, they wouldn't have known to come in in the first place, so Callus says Fulcrum definitely was beneficial and helpful. Now, here, here's, well, okay, first, it's a TIE Defender, and that's cool. Let me just say, TIE Defenders are great. 
end of the episode. Here's a bit of a problem I have with this one, though. As much good stuff as there is in here, they get out, and Kanan and Ezra go ahead and tell the rest of the crew by Hollow that Callus is Fulcrum, and I'm going, WTF is that? I mean, how guarded the information is about Fulcrums, you're telling the rest of your crew on Hollow? First off, it should never go by Hollow in the first place, and probably should never be told at all. I mean, look how guarded we were about who the identities of Fulcrum were before. Hera didn't even tell Kanan that Ahsoka was the Fulcrum she was talking to. It just feels really odd to me. The lack of trust in Callus. Yeah, sure, they've had interactions and run ins and etc., but he has the identity of Fulcrum, knows the past codes, and giving them the information. So either your whole system over the Fulcrum thing is compromised, and that means you don't trust any of it, or you should be trusting this because it is part of the system. I, I mean, heck, the other oddity is Zeb thinking, oh, I recruited Callus back there. Well, you might help push him to be more sympathetic to the rebellion. But if he's got the Fulcrum thing and the passcodes and whatnot, then clearly you didn't recruit him there because you didn't go tell him all the stuff on Fulcrum while you were there, did you? I don't think you could. So clearly somebody else had to have recruited him at some point, somebody high enough up to give him the Fulcrum status and the passcodes, right? Uh, I just, it doesn't make sense to me. Yet we're acting like this could be nefarious and some other thing going on with that. And uh, yeah, I'm, maybe I'm missing something hugely. And if so, let me know. Cause I put it down there because it, it's bugging me a bit. Yes, I understand being worried that maybe your system was compromised. And yeah, that's a legit worry. But that would be what the concern is. And if that was, that's a huge problem. And even then, you're still not talking about Fulcrum's identity over Hollow with everybody. You're still not doing that. Ah, anyway. Anyway, let's move on. We end with a little ominousness because Thrawn's over talking with Price and Callus. Something about patience and, hey, we could turn the spy into an asset. <laughs> Will Thrawn eventually figure out it's Kals? Yeah, probably. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a good episode. I, I did quite enjoy it, even with that problem. I definitely had a bit of an issue there. But the episode overall was really good, and I really enjoyed it. Although I will admit, between this and a couple episodes ago, it started to feel like I'm worried they were overusing Thrawn here. Because to be honest, aside from the cool stuff of seeing Thrawn looking at the art and the fact that the TIE Defender thing seems to be a Thrawn's project and our little ominous thing between Thrawn and Callus at the end, he really didn't need to be here. He didn't stop the Rebels from getting out. We could have had Price do the piece at the beginning with the speeder bike. She could have laid down the law and that would have been fine. I don't think Thrawn needed to be here at all for anything that happened in this episode. Uh, but anyway, at the same time, this one was okay as far as Thrawn's use. I'm just worried we're going to move toward overusing him because if we overuse him, we weaken him as a threat and a bit as a character too. And that's been my biggest worry about Thrawn and his use in Rebels. It's still okay right now. We're still okay. <laughs> uh, so, so I'm hoping. But yeah, no, I, I still like the episode, so don't take it the wrong way. So there was these four episodes. And there you go, two pretty solid episodes and two I wasn't a big fan of. It's interesting actually, we're 10 episodes in and aside from maybe taking out that facility on Lothal as the finale, I'm not really sure where we're headed. If it's that, okay, then I have caught the clue on it. If not, I'm not sure because nothing else feels really big and pointing that direction. Whereas season two, oh man, I had a pretty good idea where we were rolling or at least an idea for what was happening for probably that finale. Definitely it's going to be some kind of confrontation with Thrawn. I, I make an easy bet on that. But yeah, probably probably the TIE Defenders or maybe the facility or both. We will see soon enough. And hey, I'm also guessing that the next few episodes are going to be pretty good as it was recommended that I live stream them. So looking forward to that. And hey, it's been a while since I've live streamed Rebels at this point. So I've missed you all in the live chat talking Star Wars. So that is coming up soon. Don't worry, there'll be a regular video after that for the people who don't join the live stream or don't like them that way. So yeah, I'll see you one way or the other on the next few episodes. And hey, at that time, well, what about you? Who did you like joining the Rebellion more, Fenrau or Agent Callus? Let me know down below in the comments. And let me take a moment to thank all my wonderful patrons again. If you're interested in helping the channel through Patreon, there's a link in the description. Always appreciate it. 
And to everyone, thank you so much for watching. If you liked the video, please give it a like, a share, and don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you back here next time for another new episode of Freeform Disney. Have a magical day, and may the Force be with you, always.